I have a lifetime supply of these things. <laughs> Honestly, I just have the closets full of them. And, and some of the older ones don't fit me anymore, but they fit Boy Scouts just great. <laughs> so I know what, exactly what to do with them. I did want to talk to you a little bit of, today about Eddie Rickenbacker. Now, I think we all know who Eddie Rickenbacker was. And in our minds, we know what he did, what he was famous for. <clears throat> we know that he was a World War II hero. Oh, I'm sorry, World War I hero. He turned out to be a World War II hero as well. It, it turned out that he was born to be a hero. And, and the more you read about him, the more you research Eddie Rickenbacker as a man, the more you learn that he was destined to be great. He's not a flash in the pan sports hero. Those are not the kind of people you should go to for advice. He's not, he, I'm not even sure he was a good person to go to for advice. But my gracious, his life was so full, so rich, and he just kept jumping up and down on top of it to pack more in his entire life. He was born in 1890 in Columbus, Ohio. And during the course of his life, he had a remarkable number of near-death experiences. The first occurred when he was about 12 years old. There were mines in the Columbus area. And he and some friends got in a mine cart and thought it would be cool to roll it down the slag heap to see how fast it would go. It went pretty fast. And then it flipped over and flipped over and flipped over, and he was nearly killed that time. That was his first near-death experience. Later on in his life, he would say, if you've been there, you know how to deal with it. It gives you experience. Well, he was nearly killed a half a dozen times. But what I did want to focus on today is what happened to him in uh, October and November of 1942. It turned into a book later on called uh, Seven Came Through. Uh, there was another book written by one of the other survivors in the, in the mission which completely supports everything that Captain Eddie said in his... Oh, do you know if he was really a captain or not? <coughs> so he, when, he, when he separated from the, the, the uh, army at the, at the armistice after World War I, he was actually made a major but during the, during the war, he was a captain, so he preferred to be referred to as a captain because he, he, in his own words, earned that particular rank. That's maybe not that uncommon. So he was a captain, and then he was a major when he retired. Um, I do want to focus, though, on that little time period, but I do want to set that up a little bit and tell you what he was doing. Why was he where he was at that time? Before World War I, he was a race car driver. He had a seventh grade education. That's as far as he got. When he was 12, his father was killed in some unusual circumstances, and it led to Eddie having to support the family at that age. He took a correspondence course in engineering and worked odd jobs and various physical jobs, mostly in machine shops or, or manufacturers of carriages and vehicles to, to support the family. When World War I started, he enlisted right away, was sent to France, and his correspondence course in engineering qualified him to be the engineering officer for the 94th Aero Squadron, which is, it, things were much simpler, frankly, in 1918 than they are today. And, and uh, I mean, it's a coveted position today, and it's, it, was, it was, they were pushing it off on anybody, apparently, in 1918. Um, and initially, they weren't going to let him be an officer. His seventh grade education didn't give him enough academic prowess, <coughs> according, to the, according to the regs at the time. And so he proved himself over and over and over again. Then, then the excuse was given that they needed an engineering officer too badly to let him promote. And he demonstrated that he could train somebody else to do that job because he really, really wanted to fly. And when nobody was looking, he was learning on the sides. He was learning to fly. And his first combat mission was flown in a Newport 28 with no guns. He was just supposed to fly along and see what the other guys did and come back, which he successfully did. He went on to have 26 kills. Five of them were balloons. Uh, very rare during World War I for there to be a balloon ace. Balloons were particularly difficult targets. And uh, there were a couple of American aces who specialized in balloons. Frank Luke was another one. 
But Frank Luke died doing that. It was a very dangerous uh, role to, to take on. He also shot down mostly fighters, not observation planes. He did shoot down five observ observation planes, but it was mostly fighters, and many of them were the vaunted Fokker D7, which came about late in the war. It was a, a superior machine, maybe even superior to the SPAD that he was flying at that time. But he faced odds throughout his life that were well above his, his stated ability, and he, and he rose to the occasion. At the end of the war, he had a Medal of Honor. He had eight different DFCs. He had received the Croix de Guerre, the Legion of Merit, all kinds of different awards. He didn't want to go back to car racing, though, which is, is what had, had got him through that last few years before the entry into the war. He was, it was suggested to him that he might be able to turn his fame in, into money somehow. Now think about the time. This is 1919. The war has just ended. He was the most famous American aviator in the country and would be until 1927. He would be the only name when somebody mentioned aviation that everyone would know. So that was kind of a big deal at that time. And he did a lot of stuff. He started a car company. He co-founded a, a guitar company, which is, is still around. The car company went bankrupt. Eddie went bankrupt twice between 1919 and 1940. And each time, even though he was, he was, each time he went bankrupt, he made sure that the creditors were paid, which is, even though he was qualified not to because he became personally bankrupt as well, he was not qualified, but he was uh, not required by the government to pay back those creditors. He did. His sense of duty and responsibility are, are, are actually just a marvel when you look at it today. When you think about people who intentionally go into bankruptcy to avoid debt, this is a man who went into bankruptcy not intentionally and insisted on paying it all back. What a what a what a guy, really. So depression comes along. The uh, Roosevelt government is enacting portions of the New Deal. This is where you start to find out about Eddie's political side. He was. Fiercely anti-socialist, fiercely, uh, underlined a number of times, and uh, saw the New Deal politics as nothing more than thinly veiled socialism, and was very outspoken about it. And one of the ways he was making money at this time was running a uh, he had a had a weekly television or I'm sorry a weekly radio show on NBC, and. In his commentary, he routinely mentioned this. It was so um, it was so frustrating for the White House that they put pressure on NBC to cancel his radio show, and 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 so you saw uh, political involvement, political meddling in in media even then, maybe more than than you do now. Who knows? Um, that didn't stop. That continued right through until the war started. He also was. Fiercely isolationist, as were so many other uh, well-known aviators of the day. Lindbergh comes to mind right away. But once the war started, and and for Rickenbacker, it started when when 1939 came around and the war in England started. Now he recognized that it would eventually be America's war as well, and so he he made nice basically with the White House. He made friends with certain people in high places, including Secretary of War uh, Henry Stimson, and let him know, let Stimson know, that Rickenbacker was available if they needed him for anything. And he was already a recognized individual for his, his uh, military aviation acumen. He had been one of the testified, testifying uh, people at Billy Mitchell's uh, 1932 uh, trial which is one of the places he came into contact with some other really important people. Most of them, most, most importantly maybe is Douglas MacArthur, who was on the other side of the room and was testifying against aviation in that trial. 
they actually said some things to one another that both of them regretted later, but they were, they were, they were heated and they were very, very vocal about what they believed in. So you're starting to see this, this more complex guy start to emerge as time goes by. By 1941, just before World War II started for the U.S., he actually had become an integral part of the government's effort to rebuild the military and bring the built military up to speed and up to strength. When the war did start in 42, he became much more actively involved. Stimson actually delegated him to go to the United Kingdom and he gave him basically a carte blanche to go over there and see whatever he wanted to see, do whatever he wanted to do, talk to whoever he wanted to talk to, and then bring a detailed report back to the War Department and the White House on what he found, what he discovered. And the results of that tour are fascinating. He, the early B-17s had started to be delivered. So they were, have, they were having, the 8th Air Force was starting to, to fly missions and he had talks with the crews, he flew in the airplane, he, uh, there were some things wrong. There were some things that needed to be fixed. And over time, those things were fixed. Now, in his books, he takes credit for that. And that's, that, it, that it maybe isn't, not, that's part of him as well. The fact is that those things were known, they were actually being fixed, or were going to be fixed before he noticed. But the fact that he was willing to say something publicly is sort of important, and he did do that. He was there for a month, and, the, and during that time he met with the ambassador, the uh, representative for the Lend-Lease uh, program. He visited factories from south of England to the north of England. He visited squadrons, depots, all kinds of facilities. His report was very exhaustive. He returned from the UK on the 11th of October and turned his report in. Now, flights from the UK to the US at that time weren't a matter of hours, they were a matter of days. So he had time to do his report while he was traveling and he had a really super military aide to help him word things. The guy's name was Colonel Hans Christian Adamson. <laughs> <laughs> Not a surprise that he was Danish, but he was, he was, um, uh, Rickenbacker's closest confidant for, for almost two years. And by the time he got back to Washington on the 11th of October, his report was done and ready to be turned in. He turned it into Stimson, a copy was sent to, the, to, to President Roosevelt, and several copies were just, Hap Arnold got a copy. They, they, were, they were fairly well uh, circulated at the, at the start. But the impact was so great right away. He returns on the 11th. On the 13th, he receives a phone call from Stimson asking if he would consider doing the same thing in the Pacific. You've seen maps. The Pacific is really big. It is unconscionably big. It is ridiculously big. And, and to have returned on the 11th and then be, be detailed to leave immediately on the 13th to go out and do it again in this large area, but there was a reason they chose him. Douglas MacArthur had been very critical of the government's conduct of the war up to that point. And you know your history, you know that the decision was made, partly for political reasons, to concentrate on Europe first and the Pacific after which meant that Douglas was going to be second fiddle until the Nazis were done. And Douglas didn't do second fiddle well. So of course he was vocal about it. And Rickenbacker was given a verbal message to deliver, it was a, essentially a verbal rebuke, reprimand, to deliver personally to MacArthur. It wasn't to be written down. Nobody knows exactly what it was. Rickenbacker wouldn't say till the day he died in 1973. That message has never been written down. So we don't know exactly what Stimson or, or FDR sent to Douglas, but it was Eddie's job to deliver it. Eddie had a mission, pretty profound mission. Plus, he was supposed to go out and do fact gathering as well. And he knew how to do that. He'd just done it for a month in the UK. So. 
on the uh, he 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 had a couple days to visit with Adelaide, his wife. He had uh, and, and the two adopted sons. He he on the 19th though he was in San Francisco, and he and Hans Christian Adamson climbed onto a Boeing 314 from Pan Am, and they flew from uh, uh, Treasure Island over to uh, Honolulu, where they landed. He was met by the general who was in charge of Hickam Air Force Base. And they were given, at their, they were given uh, as their personal ride, a, a uh, obsolete Boeing B-17D. So this is a pre-war airplane that had been relegated to transport duties by 42. On that airplane, there were going to be eight guys. And here's what they were going to do. They were going to fly from Hickam Air Force Base to Canton Island. And I don't have a map here, but if you imagine the big, broad Pacific and you've got Honolulu over here, Canton is way up here. But they were going from Honolulu to Canton and then from Canton to Australia down here. Now, it would have been faster to go this way, but most of this was controlled by the Japanese. So they had to take this circuitous route through Canton. Canton is seven miles long and four miles wide, and there isn't anything else nearby. So it is a, a nasty little flat speck in the middle of a ridiculously vast Pacific Ocean. It's near where, it's a few hundred miles from where Amelia Earhart is thought to have been lost. And in fact, Canton was one of the places where they searched for her, thinking she might have ended up there. They also looked at Howell, which was another, was, was supposed to be her target. So, Eddie, Adamson, and seven other guys. William Cherry, the pilot, the Captain William Cherry, he wore cowboy boots every day. Guess where he was from? Arizona. Jersey. Yeah, I know. It wasn't Texas. Uh, Co-pilot Whitaker, Navigator, DeAngelis, uh, Reynolds was radio, Bartek was the man, it was the mechanic. And then there was another passenger on the airplane, a guy named Alexander Kazmarczyk. And if you see Kazmarczyk written down, you won't try to pronounce it. There, it's, it's an improbable combination of, of, of uh, letters that don't seem to fit together, but it's, it's a good Polish name. And he was a fellow who had been very sick, deathly sick, had been transported back to Hawaii where he was recovered, and he was supposed to transport back to his unit in Australia to, to rejoin the fight. So he was just hitching a ride. So you have these eight guys on this airplane. They all clamber, clamber on board. Now they arrived on the 19th, they arrived on the 19th, they climbed on the airplane on the 20th, so they had one night in Hawaii, got on the airplane, the airplane starts to take off, and just as the tail lifts, the left brake seizes. And the airplane goes into an immediate ground loop and stops just on the edge of the bay. Hickam's right on the water. And smoke, dust, fire trucks, ambulances, nobody's hurt. Everybody clambers out of the airplane. Uh, Cherry, who had been a co-pilot in American Airlines, which was one of Eddie's uh, fiercest competitors, Eddie was, remember Eddie was running Eastern at that time, climbs out and he goes, don't worry captain, we got plenty of these things, we'll just get you another one. And they did, in fact, round up another B-17D and they all clambered on it about midnight and they departed. What they didn't know is that the navigator had a, a, a a, a sextant that was assigned to him specifically, so you always carried your own sextant with you. And when he climbed into the airplane, he had the same sextant with him. When they had the ground loop, his sextant had fallen off the navigator's table on the ground and had damaged it. And so it was completely out of sync. And when he started using it to plot, he was plotting with erron erroneous numbers and didn't realize it. Now it's a 10 hour flight from Hickam to Canton, over trackless ocean that just extends forever. And they do the first part of it at night, they left at midnight. 10 hour, 10 and a half hour flight, the airplane's got 14 hours of fuel. <laughs> when they got up to 11 hours, they started to get a little twitchy because they hadn't seen anything. 
And what ended up happening was two things. DeAngelis' device wasn't working properly, so his sightings were inaccurate, and they misjudged the tailwinds. They had estimated the tailwinds at 10 miles per hour. They actually were running closer to 35. So the, the airplane just wasn't where it belonged. They didn't know where they were. Now, they were in radio contact with Canton. They were in radio contact with Palmyra. They were ra radio contact with a base in the Elise Islands. But none of them had the type of sophisticated gear you would expect. Palmyra didn't even have a uh, ascending set so that you could use tracking, a uh, triangulation to identify your location. They had it. It wasn't installed. It was in crates on the wharf. So they're talking, but they're not able to tell them anything. Nobody knows where they are, and they don't know where they are. But gradually, the minutes tick by, then the hours, and it became increasingly clear that they were going to have a problem. And as they drone over this, this vast ocean, nothing but blue below them, the, the, the reality of what they're about to, to face it starts to come to all of them. They gather up what survival supplies they have on the aircraft in the radio compartment because the, the primary in exit from the plane uh, in a ditching is through the hatch over the radio compartment. So they pile up everything they've got. They've got thermoses, they've got food packages, they've got uh, two three-man rafts, they have one two-man raft. They get The two-man raft is, is mounted on top of the aircraft, but they know where everything is. They're ready. <laughs> Cherry brings that airplane down. One engine quits, another engine quits. They know they're going down. He makes a perfect landing in 12-foot swells. Not a simple thing, but he does a really good landing. In spite of it being a good landing, it's terrible conditions, and a number of the guys are injured. Bartek has a, has a terrible cut on his nose, and um, uh, Reynolds, I'm sorry, Reynolds has the cut on his nose. Bartek has a, a real bad gash in his hand, but the worst was Hans Adamson. He had been thrown against a bulkhead when the airplane stopped and it injured his back real badly. Water starts rushing in to the airplane. It's not a seaplane. Water starts to rush in. The hatch comes off. Everybody jumps out of the airplane. They deploy the rafts. They climb into the rafts. They're worried about suction from the airplane pulling them, so they paddle a little ways away. Then they realize all those supplies are still sitting on the table in the radio room. All the water, all the coffee, all the fresh orange juice, all the donuts, all that stuff. It's, and, and survival gear, blankets, stuff like that. Which they, and to make matters worse, several of them stripped down, stripped down to their skivvies because, the, because they, they were going swimming. So they, they, they were completely unprepared. They climbed into the rafts. Suddenly it occurs. Where's the water? It's still on the plane. Well, they debated between the, between the eight of them. They actually debated whether they should go back into the airplane and try to get it. And the airplane stayed afloat for over six minutes, which was plenty of time, really, to go in and get something. It was, it was one of a couple of critical mistakes. And, and the, the first one was not recognizing right away that they didn't know where they were, and the second one was leaving their supplies inside the aircraft. When they were getting into the rafts, Al, I'm going to call him Al, Alex, because Kazmarczyk is, 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 is a mouthful. Alex, who didn't swim, fell off the wing into the sea and nearly drowned. He ingested a lot of salt water. They got him back on board, but in, in, in addition to the salt water and the trauma of, of, the, of the near drowning, he still wasn't fully recovered from the in illness he had been in Hawaii to treat. So he was in bad shape right from the start. Adamson, uh, Hans Christian, could barely move because of his back injury, and he was also in pretty poor shape. Eddie, not so bad. He got out of the airplane. He still had a brand new summer suit on. He still had his old felt hat on. He was, and he brought his cane which he, he promptly threw out of the airplane, out of the boat. But most of the guys were in pretty poor shape. They had only the small um, first aid kits that the, that the rafts came with, and they had um, four oranges. That's all they had. Now, two of them had candy bars in their pockets, but they were immersed in salt water right away, and, and honestly, within minutes, they were mush. 
So they had uh, that's that's what they started off with. And as they paddled, as the airplane sank and they paddled away, they started to take stock of their situation. One of the things that I, the reason I brought these books is that there have been a lot of books written about Captain Eddie, and this this excellent autobi, uh, this excellent biography was written in 2005. It's probably the most recent, and it's probably the most authoritative, but it's not the most visceral. It's actually, it's, it's not, not the easiest read. But if you want real hard, cold facts, that's where you're going to find them. This one was the first one to come out after the event, and it's called Seven Came Through. Where's Mike? Mike loaned this book to me. He bought this book at a used bookstore in Pacific Beach in... Oh, so 79. Yeah, so 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And it's fascinating, not the least of which because it's signed. Wow. By Eddie. Is that not cool? I think that's just freaking awesome. 75 cents. He bought it for 75 cents. He bought it for 75 cents. So this book he wrote, and I think he needed to, re to, to write a book. I think he, he needed to, to, to let it all out. And this book allowed him that opportunity to do it. I'll give him a dollar for it. Well, there you go. See, you. so you're up 21 cents. Do I hear a dollar fifty? Um, uh, and I, I read this book when I was a teenager, and I've read it several times since then. It's, it's, it's a really powerful book. It is full of mistakes, not the least of which he claims they were at sea for 21 days. They weren't. They were at sea for 24 days. 24 days. Now he was trying to keep track. But time meant so little when they were sitting in those rafts that he lost track. And it wasn't until after this book came out that somebody said, you know, Eddie, it was 24 days. My favorite book actually is this one. This is his biography, his autobiography. And he wrote this <laughs> in 1965. He passed away in 1973. In 65, the memories were vivid, but I think he'd also had enough time and help from, from, from letting it all out to put everything in context and to have a, a really clear vision of who he was and what this, what this was all about for him. So there they are on this raft. Their, their technical leader is Captain Cherry. He's, the, leading, he's the, the ranking officer in the group, and he was the captain of the airplane. Three months before, Cherry had been flying DC-3s for American Airlines. He was not a military guy. And he, he, he was one of the few who got out of the airplane, but he still had his boots on. And, and uh, with all of his, he came out with all his gear, completely closed, still had his sidearm. Um, but he wasn't a leader. He was a good pilot, but he wasn't a leader. And it was a, a, around this time that it became clear to Eddie that something different was going to have to be something he was going to have to take charge now bear in mind he's not a young guy at this point and he's surrounded by officers now Adamson who's a colonel was out of the picture because of his injury he couldn't do anything and and yet civilian Eddie took charge and he didn't fool around when he took charge he he took the, the situation by the throat and held on to it for the next three and a half weeks. And it, it's really remarkable. He said that the, one of the first things he did was he established two hour watches. Now who does that in a boat when you're, when you're floating in a raft? But he did it not because they were actually going to find anything, but because the hope of finding something would keep them focused and it would keep them alive. And in his mind, all of that stuff is making sense. I guarantee none of the other seven guys were thinking about that. In his mind, and he said this later, together we could help one another. In his mind, he knew that he needed them to help him help them all survive. And his grasp of these basic leadership tenets is so clear and so concise. It, it, it really is pretty remarkable to hear him saying it in, in 65 when he wrote the book. As they paddled around the airplane, they noticed that the water seemed to be moving around them. It was, they were surrounded by sharks. 
And the sharks were their constant companions for the next three weeks. But curiously, the heat got so bad that they, they decided that the heck with the sharks, and they would actually go over the side of the raft to get some relief from the heat in the, in the middle of the day. And, and uh, the sharks left them alone, although they were always there. Climb back in the boat, and right away, they started to have sores from salt, salt exposure. Their little injuries, um, uh, uh, Bartek's nose injury and the other guy's hand injury would not heal. And the hand injury was pretty <coughs> severe. It went too long. They did the best they could. In one of the first aid kits, there was iodine. We put iodine on it, but the iodine would just wash off every time a wave would come by. I should describe the boats. The boats were um, Army standard issue, Army Air Force standard issue, supposedly five-man boats and one three-man boat. But they couldn't, there was no way to get more than three people in one of these boats for any length of time. And these guys were in these boats. They were never not touching one another for the next three weeks. They were always touching one another. And in the two-man boat, the guys actually slept with, with their shoulders on each other's, I'm sorry, with their feet on each other's shoulders. That's how small the boat was. They couldn't sit up on the up on the on the sides because it would t cause the boat to topple in the in the in the waves. One of his quotes at this time was that with my acute sense of responsibility, I could never relax. And you can see that leadership in him again in that in that statement that that strong sense of leadership. He had, and he went on to say that he had a mission. His mission was everything to him. He needed to complete his mission. And it, you know, this is that verbal thing, that verbal, verbal spank on the wrist he's supposed to give to MacArthur. But it was so important to him to accomplish his mission that it gave him a purpose. We had to keep hoping. We had to keep looking. We couldn't give up. People who give up, they don't survive. Well, one of the interesting things that came out of this, this series of, of adventures is that this book is used as the primary tenant for Alcoholics Anonymous today, which I didn't know until I started researching this. But the idea that you're much more likely to survive together than you are alone, that if you don't have hope, if you don't have drive, you will fail. All of that stuff came out of Seven Survived. Even if it wasn't 21 days, those basic facts of leadership are absolutely true. And, and, uh, and they're, they're remarkably similar to, to uh, leadership skills that we were taught at Trader Joe's when I was working there. After about two weeks, a lot of the men had started to give up hope. Now, Eddie had been, been their father, their mother, their priest, their confessor, a bully when, it, when he needed to be, but he had been all of those things, depending on what each individual needed to help them get through. And, and this, is, this is the one that resonated the most with me from, from my, my work experience, because that's how you respond. You don't respond with vanilla direction. Your direction needs to be focused on what this person needs. What that person needs is probably different. And that person is going to get a different kind of treatment. Two weeks in, even though several of the people in the group were essentially atheists, he insisted that they start a twice daily prayer meeting. They had uh, somehow ended up with part of a Bible in the airplane or in the raft. So they would take turns reading passages out of the Bible. And then they would sing some songs, and they would do it morning, and they would do it at night. And on the this started this started about ten days into the into the event. On the eighth day, they did their little prayer thing in the morning. And then he pulled his hat down over his head and was trying to sleep. And it was just baking hot. He was trying to sleep, and then all of a sudden he felt something on his head. 
And he could tell by the way the other guys were looking at him and by the way it felt that a seagull had landed on his hat. Now, they hadn't had anything since the oranges ran out on the third day to eat. So it's been a week and a half. Or it's been all of a week since they've eaten anything. They haven't had anything to drink at all since, since this ordeal started. So he's got a bird on his hat. So without moving the rest of his body, and this was very painful for him, he very slowly moved his hands up. And he could tell that the, by the, the expressions on the other survivors, don't screw this up. Yeah. Do not screw this up. You've got one chance, don't screw this up. And it's, it's not like they were hoping. He said that wasn't the one. So he gets his hands up there, and then he grabs, and he gets a foot. So he gets the bird. And that's the first thing that they had eaten in, in, over, in over 10 days. Now, it wasn't delicious, and they didn't cook it. But it came after seven days of prayer, which to Eddie meant an awful lot, because he could share that with the other survivors and help them keep focused on things that were, on what was really important. So they, they, his description of how they cut up the oranges is fascinating. He said that he was given the honor and the duty of cutting up the oranges. And of course, the, later on, the bird. So he had some piece of flat metal, I think it was a signaling mirror or something, and they had a sheath knife. So he would cut those oranges in half and then and then in, into eight piece, eight individual pieces. And he said he never felt so acutely aware of people watching him as he did when he was trying to cut up those oranges to make sure that everybody got the same amount. And uh, he said that if there was one that looked any smaller than the others, that was his. That was just the rule that he adopted. And, and so he and used the same rule with the bird. They cut the bird up. But miracle of miracles, that same day that they caught the bird, they caught two fish. One on a line, he got a little sea bass on a line. They had uh, some fishing line in the, uh, in the first aid kit. And they had used some of the bird's intestines for bait when they caught fish. And then they got another one. They got a fingerling. So they ate the fingerling the same day. And they kept the bass for two days and they ate it. And so they had these little miracles during this thing that helped them to survive, to get through this thing. But he really had to keep on top of them because in, in his own words, he said, determined men can do anything. It doesn't matter what they have. It doesn't matter who they are. If they're determined, they can achieve anything. At one point, he became aware that three guys in one of the other rafts had sworn an oath that he had been so tough on them that they were going to stay alive long enough to see him buried. And he said that the moment he knew that, he knew he had those three guys, he had them in his pocket. He had them right where he wanted them. They were determined. They had something to live for, just like he had his mission. He said at one point, if you've been there before, your experience, you know what to do. Now he'd been at death's door several times. He didn't been reported dead twice. I mean, starting with the coal cart in, in Columbus, but in 1940, February 1940, he was taking a flight from Atlanta, Georgia to New York City. And the DC-3 was in crashed right after takeoff. And it crashed in a real swampy area not too far from Atlanta. The airplane flipped upside down. Eddie was, he had, two broken ribs, he had internal bleeding, one of his eyes had popped out of his socket. He was ingesting fuel, aviation fuel, and was crushed down on the chest of a dead passenger by the weight of the aircraft wreckage. And he was like that for almost 12 hours. When they find, when the rescuers finally got there, oh, oh and while he was there, he was shouting words of hope and encouragement to the other survivors. Don't stray off, stay with the wreck. This is what they'll find first. He spent all of his time trying to encourage, even though it would appear that he was on death's door. 
And they couldn't extricate him. It wasn't until the rescuers got there that they extricated him. They thought he was dead. They put a, toe on, a tag on his toe and hauled him out. And when they got him to the hospital, somebody started to, to triage him. And one of the doctors said, we've got living to work with. Let's, let's move over here. And about that time, I guess he wiggled the toe. Maybe the tag caught somebody's attention. But he had been through some pretty dramatic things in his, in his life. And, and on, honestly, in 1941, he was still recovering from that accident. His, uh, sitting in the raft in those constrained conditions were just excruciatingly painful for him. But he rose above that. And they rose above it because, and I quote, I had a mission to perform. I had a message to deliver. What, what a devotion to duty and responsibility. Uh, on the 13th day, little Alex died. What it, tur it turned out that Alex had been drinking seawater in the night, and seawater had caused his, it, it had killed him, basically. He was already quite sick and he passed away. Um, they buried him at sea. On the 19th day, they saw an airplane. First thing they had seen since they crashed. But it was a long ways away, and it was not headed toward them. But they did see an airplane, and that gave them a day's hope. But it only lasted a day, because they didn't see anything the next two days. But on the, on the 23rd day, they were really starting to get desperate. They hadn't had anything to drink still. They hadn't had, oh, except for one rain squall that had gone over them and they captured just a small amount of water. They decided to split up. Maybe if they were in a, law, a bigger area, a search plane might spot them. That was, that was the, the reasoning that was used. So they cut the, cut the lines and the three rafts drifted apart. Eddie advised against it. Eddie didn't think that was a good idea. It didn't turn out so bad. That was on the 23rd day. On the 24th day, Eddie and the two other guys, Adamson and uh, the other guy in his raft, Williams in his raft, are all sort of dozing, but it's Williams' watch. And Williams is, is awake and aware. And he kicks Eddie, which wasn't a nice thing to do, and said, I hear something. And Eddie, Eddie takes his hat off and they start looking. They can't see anything. The sun is just blindingly bright. But they do. They both hear it. And they can both hear it. And it's getting louder. It's not going away. It's getting louder. And all of a sudden, there's a little speck off in some direction off that way. And they're both focused on that little speck as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it goes right over. It's a, a Navy Vaughn Kingfisher. And the pilot has seen them. And he went right over them, curled around, did a couple circles around them as he was watching. They were watching them. Now what they didn't know, but what was, ob was probably obvious, is, is he's calling in that I found a raft, there are living survivors. And Eddie's down there waving his hat. Eventually the guy, is done with making his report. He lands the airplane and taxis over to where they are. And the guy's name is um, Lieutenant William Eady from Evanston, Illinois. He was an Eagle Scout. In fact, his story was featured in Boy's Life magazine several times, as you, as you might imagine, uh, during the war and, and then after the war. Eady taxis over to them. Eddie reaches out and grabs the outrigger float so they won't separate. The radioman climbs out on the wing and pulls them around to the main float, and they haul all three of them up out of the raft. A Vought Kingfisher is not a big, I mean, it's a good size airplane, but it only holds two people, and it's already got two folks in it. Adamson, Adamson's injuries are so bad that they put Adamson in the radioman's seat, and then the radioman sat on Adamson's lap. They lashed uh, Rickenbacker and Williams to the wings. And, and I, I, I didn't know this. I, I'd always seen illustrations of it that show them riding the wings looking ahead. That isn't how they lashed them up. They lashed them up feet front. So they were looking aft, but 
I, I don't know why, but they did do that. Oh, I suspect it might have been so that their feet could maybe hold them onto the slippery wing surface. But the pilot said, I can't take off with you all on the airplane. The base in the Elise Islands is 40 miles away. We're going to taxi there. In, it, at this time, there were eight foot seas, and they were going to taxi 40 miles in this kingfisher. <laughs> so they didn't. They didn't have to. Oh, I have to put this in. They saw the airplane, they recognized it was Navy, and Eddie shouted as loud as his lungs would let him, God bless the Navy. <laughs> of course. Of course he did. So they start taxiing. They're, uh, they've, they've only gone a very short distance when a torpedo boat appears, and then another torpedo boat appears. And in the distance, they can see that there's a larger vessel as well. So the decision is made to move Williams and Rickenbacker onto one of the torpedo boats and then to the other ship. The other ship was the USS Hilo. Now, the Hilo had been a pre-war billionaire's yacht it, that the Navy had ended up with and had converted into a torpedo boat tender. And look it up online. You have a good looking boat. Really a nice looking boat. But I imagine the Navy stripped all the nice out of the middle. But anyhow, the PT boat takes them between the uh, Kingfisher and the Hilo. Eddie drank four quarts of water. Probably not the best thing for him, but he could not stop drinking. He just couldn't stop. So they get to the Hilo, and they 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 hoist these guys up onto the Hilo. Neither of them can walk. Neither of them can even stand. And they get them on board, and. Eddie asks for help to stand. So two officers help him to get up. And the first words out of his mouth to the captain of the Hilo were, I'm glad to be aboard, sir. And the captain said, we, we are so glad to have found you. And then Eddie goes, I've never been on a ship like this. Can I have a tour? <laughs> This is a man whose mission was absolutely indelibly etched in his sight. Can I have a tour? So he was he was still on still on point, still on mission. Once on board, they told him that the other two rafts had been found. The one guy all alone had been found by another airplane. The two guys in the other raft had washed up on an island that was not occupied by the Japanese. It was uh, it had friendly natives. They had taken care of the two guys until the Navy could come pick them up. <laughs> and the hero turned around went to the Elise Islands where all seven of them were reunited. Uh, this all happened on the 24th of November. On the 1st of December, Eddie was in another bomber headed southeast to meet up with MacArthur at Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. They went to Australia, then he got on a different airplane, flew to Papua New Guinea. The whole way, Eddie was worried because his his interaction with MacArthur back in the 30s had been so negative. And he just assumed that for what little he knew about MacArthur, MacArthur would still be holding a grudge, it would still be a rancorous meeting. So they, they land at Port Moresby, and he's gritting his teeth because he's got to complete the mission. He's not looking forward to this. He gets off the airplane. There's four guys standing there waiting for him, and one of them is obviously driven, uh, Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur walks over to him and embraces him, and he said, we thought we'd lost you. And then he said, I want you to know that I may have done more to hurt the Army Air Force than I had ever intended back then, and I was so wrong, and now I'm doing everything I can to right it. And of course, he relied heavily on air power in his island hopping campaign to uh, through the world. Their meeting went off smoothly. He delivered his message, got back on an airplane, flew back back to Australia, and then from Australia he went to Guadalcanal. He visited with the soldiers and the, the sailors that were on Guadalcanal at that time. Um, he wanted that to be part of the report. 
and it was back to the Elise Islands where he picked up at Palmyra, where he picked up the rest of the survivors, and they all came back to the states together from Hawaii. Uh, Eighty, the man who had rescued them, didn't survive the war. In February 1945, he was launched on a search mission from a vessel, and never came back. Never came back. But Eddie. Eddie went on to live until 1973, and he was home in time for Christmas with Adelaide and the boys. I think the one thing that he said in, in the books that meant the most to me was that when he got into the boat, he said to himself, somebody is going to have to pull these men together, and that somebody is me. And he stuck to that for the next 24 days. And I think that's just an extraordinary guy. I mean, what if you're looking for a, a definition of what a real hero is, I don't think you have to look any farther than this guy. That's it. Thank you very much.